Okay, so let's get started. These are today's learning goals and uh, to summarize them, you'll see if you've paid very close attention, you might notice that some of the uh, CISSP areas of knowledge overlap with previous lectures. And that's because we're building on the previous stuff uh, with regards to uh, encryption, security, so the last few courses, and um, identity and access management <coughs> to get to the concept of multi-level security. Now, once again, if you have questions, just raise your hand. Uh, I will also challenge you to see if hopefully some of the material from the previous lectures still remains somewhere in a dark corner of the brain. <coughs> it's chapter 13 of the book. So um, if you're, I see some people with the book out already. So if you have the, uh, the book ready, make sure, and you are going to the practical courses later on, if you're one of the security students, uh, take the book with you and start making notes. There are some explanations that I will be giving that will greatly help you uh, during this lecture and hopefully also during the practical work. So, um, this is a bit of an open door. <coughs> Everything is buggy. That, we all know that. I mean, we, if you don't uh, you basically open any uh, decent news website and there's always something broken somewhere, some information system. But um, the point is, is that you need to have security that operates from this principle as well. You need to work from the principle of assumption that everything is broken, buggy and so on. You can never assume that things are working right. So you assume the best and you plan for the worst. You always plan for the worst when it comes to security. <coughs> and this is both uh, design and implementation related. And what I would like to point out, we're going to, uh, as the lecture progresses, we'll get to a few sheets about uh, evaluation, uh, the common criteria for, uh, um, for lots of things like, uh, <coughs> in particular, actually the uh, getting certified or getting certifications of how well your security is in order. And um, there's also a, sometimes a misconception, and particularly managers can be guilty of this, to single out a, a, an easy to single out group. Ne you can have the best procedures in the world, but if you don't adhere to them, you're also hosed. It, it's not going to bring you anything. So it's not just design implementation, also the processes around it need to be covered properly and so on. So, um, The Bella Padula model is very influential, and you'll see why. It's, it's also very old, it's from the 70s. And it says, initially funded by the US DOD. It's an easy question to get you started, but why? Military. Yeah, of course, the DOD is the military, but why specifically the military? Because the, mil the, the military has to be in front of uh, technologies before the enemies do so. Exactly. But that also means uh, w even within the country, the military of course started this whole thing, computer systems and um, if you remember computers were initially used for everything from uh, calculating the arcs of missiles and uh, cannons and so on. They were initially used for that and there is no uh, organization that is more concerned with security and classifications and uh, of security and so forth than the military. So it's logical that they would start with this. I mean, even the whole concept of computers and the internet has a, a, its history in the military after all. So it's logical also that they would be the first ones to get started with this. Okay. So the Abella Padula model, as you will see, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly actually. Let me just turn the volume down. There we go. Like I said, it's from the 1950s. It's a formal model. So um, you can implement formal models as a, to, into software, hardware, and so on. But it's first and foremost a way of modeling things and describing them. And I'm guessing that this rings a bell these classifications. I'm sure you've all seen them before. 
This is a clear indicator of this influence of the military, obviously. They work with these kinds of classifications. For your eyes only, there are many others. And you will see that the BLP model is also very hierarchical in this sense. Military loves hierarchy. Everyone tells everyone below them what to do. So there's subjects and objects. You, you will remember this from previous lectures. The subject is usually a person or something that resembles a person, maybe a, a process. And objects, the actual data, concerned most of the time. A subject has a clearance, so that's one of these, uh, usually a clearance top secret, and they have, uh, uh, these objects have them as well, and they say what kind of clearance is needed to access them. So they have the classifications. Um, <coughs> I'll skip to the next sheet. The last one is a bit obvious. So, what access modes does BLP recognize? And um, is this readable for everything? Uh, for everything? For everything? For everyone? Pardon? Sure. So uh, I want you to make um, close note of the descriptions that are given in these things in these uh, four arrows because there are some very subtle things and it's easy to confuse what is meant with multi-level security this, these two descriptions da down here so there's the principle of no read-up which is also the simple security property and there's the star it's pronounced as a star property which says no write down we'll get into that later why they're called what they are and what they why you need them <coughs> but if you look very closely the star property is described as a subject can only write into an object of greater or equal security level. So what is the arrow that corresponds to this one, to this star property? Append, yes. Not write. It's a bit counterintuitive because they call it no write down, but they are talking about append in this case. And it will become instantly obvious why it is appending in the next sheet. So, no read up, <coughs> the simple security property, and there's also the discretionary security property, but that's also in the next sheet. So, look at this example. It's uh, <coughs> actually from the original sheets, but it's very obvious where these things come from. So we have a malicious subject, I don't know why he's wearing a hat with a skull, a skull and crossbones, but apparently he has high level security clearance, I don't think he's in the military in this outfit. And we have two level uh, objects, one low level and one high level, but these are the um, <coughs> examples of why you would need the star property. So it was the no write down. Normally, you can only get this flow of information. If someone with a high level security clearance is able to observe, read up, that's a security risk. If he's able to alter the information, it's a violation of no write down. So my question is, why would you need write up? Can you think of an example why you would why write up is desirable? Because it seems a bit counterintuitive if you think about it right now, perhaps. Why would you have something with a lower security clearance? It's not readily obvious in uh, sorry, sorry this sheet why you would want that, but why would something with lower security clearance write into something with higher security clearance. Can you think of an example? And you actually, I'm 100% I'm sure all of you know this example if someone actually says it. Logging. Exactly, logging stuff. Isn't that what logging is all about? I see some people smiling. I hope it's because of the answer. Thank you, Joran. But logging stuff is an ex excellent example of this. Some, something not important 
is most likely still being logged. What does it do uh, or who is still being logged? And information gets written somewhere and maybe even to a file that contains lots of information about all different kinds of objects and subjects and so on. <coughs> but it would need write up. This log file probably contains sensitive information about other people which you wa didn't want other people to know. So you would ha want to have no read up as well. So logging is not, not a half bad example actually. Does everyone understand this? Now does it, is it a little bit clearer? Who doesn't understand this because this is... Okay, excellent. So that's a good example logging. So there's a way of formally describing this. Um, <coughs> basically this is a mathematical way of describing what I just said. We're only going to f uh, focus on uh, this one most of all. It's the discretionary security principle. Uh, sorry, discrete security, pardon me. <coughs> what It says here, if you have a combination of a subject and an object, <coughs> you are using an access matrix for it. There will be an access matrix for that. This is uh, a very roundabout way of sa saying you have something like discretionary access control using an access matrix. And you've all seen this. It can be discretionary access controls, the classical way of doing it under Unix. We've seen this before. So that's what it says. <coughs> the whole point of this is because you can write this as formula, this is just a way of, like, uh, as I said previously, of describing what was called the no read, read up and the, uh, so these two, no read up and no write down principles. Just a mathematical way of writing them down. You can actually describe this for an entire system. So you could prove, theoretically, that a system is secure or not using this. Now, it's a bit of an obvious question and it already says in practice it's usually not possible. But what, is the, what are the practical problems with this? Systems are ready. Well, let's assume for uh, someone in, in front said systems are buggy, that's true. But let's for a second uh, very naively assume that our system isn't buggy. <laughs> What's still the a very obvious practical problem with this? You. Once again, our system, we're describing a system right now, not humans. I don't want to describe humans. You'll get into arguments with people when you try to. It's even more obvious than that. Why is this usually not possible in practice? Or at least very difficult. Uh, yes? Files exactly. It's just a question of complexity. It's extremely complex to model an entire system, let alone a single system. Now let's for a second think about a complex system, many systems, many parts of infrastructure which you're going to have to describe. It's extremely difficult. So um, there are uh, rules, they follow logically. You can get progressively more uh, rights, for lack of a better word. So those are the BLP rules. And <coughs> if you look very closely at this, I won't hang, uh, uh, stay too long on the BLP <coughs> stuff anymore, but here you will st see things that will start to look familiar. Anyone recognize anything in this sheet? There are many of these diagrams and uh, rather than uh, Working through every diagram and every part of it, I will light, uh, point out some critical parts. Are there any obvious things when you look at this diagram? You might recognize some parts. Nothing at all? Read, execute, write. Yes, exactly. Familiar names start popping up. You can see that concepts of operating systems have been modeled on this BLP stuff. Remember, just if you're ever in doubt why some systems work the way they do, it's usually enough to start looking at history. That's always my 
first tip, look at where they came from and how they evolved. You will see the same, suddenly see naming that is coincides with these kinds of things. Yes? Does MLS stand for multi-level <coughs> No, it stands for this, okay. multi-level security. Good question. Thank you for the nice bridge into the next sheet. Um, <coughs> in a very roundabout way, multi-level security, and it's described uh, uh, very extensively here. The whole point of multi-level security is that you have a system where you can have lots of different kinds of security clearances, uh, security classifications, and so on, and they are all working together and all nicely separated and access is granted as it should be, etc. So that's, that's a very uh, short way of describing what's said here. That's multi-level security. The name already implies it. You have multiple levels of security on a single system, usually, or with, contained within a single infrastructure, and they all operate with some constraints. Basically it says <coughs> there is separation of the users and the classified material, etc. You have some form of access control and so on. So there is a problem, however, with BLP. Incompa incompatibility of confidentiality and integrity within a single MLS system. And um, it says it can work for powers or secrets, but not both. Um, my question is, why is this the case with BLP? Can anyone explain to me, because you should be familiar with the concepts of CIA now, why does this only, right now, concern confidentiality? What we've just described. So what were the definitions of these two concepts? Um, not only the one, the system that is allowed to read or write or whatever, do an alteration of an object is allowed to actually read that, but if you want integrity, you need a third party to check um, that's a way of uh, establishing integrity, but what, is, what were the definitions? But well, you're, you're in the right area, actually. Confidentiality, what is the definition? A, a simple definition of confidentiality? Only the users or systems that are allowed to read it or see or actually do. Yeah. These, this object can only be accessed by the right people under the right circumstances, something in that area, exactly. And what is integrity about? Is the data correct? Is the data what it should be in one sentence? And then it's immediately obvious that BLP does nothing or little to deal with that problem. Right now we've only talked about classification of systems and having clearances to access things. And so <coughs> You can have real world problems and uh, there's actually a very good definition of covert channels. So um, in the book, so I would strongly recommend you read up on what covert channels are because these are also real world problems you might run into. You can have very practical problems. So let's say you have a shared resource, you're both uh, working in the same document but the two people working in the same document, even a very simple practical assembly. example, one of them is, a, is the general and one is a private, but they're secretly in cahoots with each other and sharing information and doing things behind the system's back, a very practical analog form of a covert channel. There's no way of preventing that. And, well, it might not be a huge issue in the, the example I just described, but you can probably imagine the risks on a computer system where something like this might occur. If it's executable data, it becomes riskier. So, uh, you have the BIBA integrity model. Ooh. Um, I made some changes to the original sheets actually to make it a bit more clear. They still have the similar, similarly named uh, ideas of no read down and no write up. 
So you have simple integrity. And that's, that basically means, I wrote down a nice description, a subject at a given level of integrity, so subject at a given level of integrity, is not supposed to read objects of a given integrity, integrity at the same level or lower. So it's still the same idea of no read down. Conversely, you also have integrity confinement, which is no write up. It's the same thing, pretty much the star property of the BMA model, but in reverse. So a subject at a given level of integrity should not be writing into objects of a higher integrity level. It's still the same principles and the formulas almost look the same as well. And you have uh, uh, the last one, that's the invocation property. And you can think of this as no privilege escalation. Well, let's see if I... So I had a nice description of that one. So the idea is also that, um, for instance, assume that you are uh, using a, a program and it will run at a certain level, integrity level, it should not be requesting higher access at any point. A way of thinking about this is privilege escalation. That might be a term you're familiar with. That's something you would want to avoid for many reasons. Because usually if this happens, you, at one point you might, va inv well, sorry, that's the wrong word. At some point you might be breaking that rule. If something at a lo that started at a lower integrity level is suddenly gaining more privileges, it might start riding up. So is this clear? This is also a way of dealing with, there are models also to deal with integrity. So these are just very simple um, descriptions. Now the next sheet is, looks like a mess. I'm going to warn you beforehand, but it's, it's not that hard to understand. Um, this is the Clark Wilson integrity rules. And there's lots of abbreviations, and there's even some abbreviations that are not in the sheet. I had to look this, up one, uh, this one up already as well. This is very interesting for people who make all these models and who like drawing, I guess. Um, you have certification rules, that's the single C's, and you have enforcement rules. So I hope that already makes it a little bit clearer. You have constrained data items and unconstrained data items, the CDIs and the UDIs. You have the transformation procedure. This is basically a very nice way of saying something is going to change. There's a procedure for it, transformation procedure. And you have the integrity verification procedures. And where are they? Here. <laughs> that one here. So um, just to give you an idea, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, this is what I uh, was afraid of. There goes the voice. <coughs> um, just look at at it from this part for a brief second to get an idea. So there are enforcement rules usually in place on a system that say there must there is a rule being enforced that a user must be authenticated for this transformation procedure. And the transformation procedure might also have rules that it needs to be authenticated, this user, to actually use the transformation procedure. And you have the certification rules that go with it. And all these things get checked before eventually something starts happening to these constrained data items and so on. I saw you had a question. Yeah, why is it now CDI to a UDI process? <coughs> there isn't apparently in this example. It's just an example. Okay, so this, this how is how you should, sorry, uh, I got a bit of track. Uh, this is how you should read this. So, once again, um, you can model all these things. And these things are being modeled. But the problem is make, uh, making no mistakes in modeling it and successfully enforcing everything, that everything also works. So, 
as I said previously, we'll slowly also get into the whole idea of assurance and evaluation and the usually accompanying certifications and so on. These are all very extensive and complex procedures. So, um, <coughs> the whole idea is, is that you can do these kinds of things. So, look at the set of all objects you have. Just this. And that you're, with high granularity, you can say users have parts, uh, sorry, have access to parts of these collections explicitly. They don't have access to parts of the other collections explicitly and so on. And they might still have access implicitly to parts of it and so on. In the end, it still boils down to having some form of access control. That's the whole point. So, um, we're in 26 minutes. Um, I'll take a short break. I need to drink something. Sorry. My voice is a. Uh, could you pause it for me? Thank you. So, all right. So, um, <coughs> has anyone heard of trust, trusted computing? By any chance? Yes? Heard of. Has anyone seen it, used, or also possible? Okay. Um, it might surprise you, but most of the desktops, I, I can't actually remove that, but most of the desktops around the HA have technology to do this. Um, if I mention terms like Intel vPro, and usually they also come with uh, technology for this, this idea, this concept of trusted computing. So there uh, are several terms, and rather than read them all from the sheet, I want to point out some of the important aspects. So if you look at the trusted computer system, this one, they are saying, read carefully, it says simultaneous processing of a range of blah blah. So this is once again, what, which concept comes back here? We just had that. The whole idea of so simultaneous processing of a range of sensitive or classified information. MLS? Yes, exactly, MLS. <coughs> Thanks, Aron. <coughs> so the multi-level security aspect. So assurance, think about quality assurance and so on. Very important. And evaluation, and as I mentioned previously, we'll get into more details here. Um, <coughs> this usually involves things like doing audits uh, or maybe pen tests as part of these audits to see if the system performs, works as intended and so on. It's also frequently part of uh, certification, certification uh, projects and so on that you do this. But it's a very important aspect. Think back about what I said at the beginning. It's not just about designing and implementing and maybe uh, and hopefully modeling all this stuff. It's also checking if it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. Very important. <coughs> I can, um, it, it's a bit of a forced parallel, but rem make sure you remember that last step because it, it's not any different from thinking about Security, it's not just about prevention, it's all about detection and mitigation as well. Often overlooked partially or completely. So evaluation is a very important aspect. Um, this is just a nice diagram that, says, uh, that shows you the concept of a reference monitor, some system or system part that sees the subjects coming in, checks the policies, applies them for access to the objects, and an audit file is written. And what is an audit file? Come on then. Logging, Logging usually some form of. <coughs> and how does it know which policies there are? 
it has this huge database that says these are the classifications, the clearances and so on. Um, some important part, uh, things to remember. Is there a computer involved in this? <coughs> Here we go again. Hmm? Not per se. Once again, we're an IT studies, but this is not necessarily a technical... <coughs> oh, please don't. This is not necessarily a technical exercise that can be done with computers only. There can, this can all be perfectly done with pen and paper. In fact, many of these things are sometimes done with pen and paper. It's not always a viable idea to do it with a computer. So remember that for many of these concepts there is not necessarily a computer system involved. Um, an example of what such a reference monitor can do, so you read it A, B, C, D, a bit illogical, but let's say there's a Trojan present on Alice's side, unfortunately for her in this case. <coughs> the access rights are listed at the top right, so there is a back pocket file which Alice has read and write access to and Bob write access. So Bob wants to do something with this program. He has read and write access to the accompanying data file that goes with it. Then the reference monitor checks to see if the policies are in order. They might be. But <coughs> the Trojan tries to do something and access is blocked because Bob doesn't actually have, as you can see, what access is Bob missing? Read for that part, exactly. <coughs> so that's what you can do. So this is a bit more complex than normal discretionary access control. What kind of access control is this? Take a guess what's on the next sheet. You should have remembered this from the IAM lecture. Two, uh, th sorry, three weeks ago. Yeah, role-based access control. Oh, <laughs> exactly. Oh. <coughs> this is role-based access control. So you have Bob apparently has a different role, which means he has different rights to different parts. of the system, either programs or data files or whatever. All right, so um, we've covered role-based access control. Um, this is once again a very formulaic way of describing them all. Um, we're using set theory, so I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to wa walk through the entire sheet. I'm, you should be familiar with set theory. I think you've all had it as part of your math classes, and I'm assuming our guest student, for instance, as well. Set theory in math. Not really, okay. Um, okay, so if you have problems with this, please approach Ershad or me afterwards and sure. we'll get you started. It's, it looks more complicated than it is. <coughs> so, um, back to the sheet. Um, databases are <coughs> a special case in, in some ways because for databases, these techniques of access control and uh, classification or clearances rather of information can also be applied but then you will quickly run into some limitations with most databases very concretely rather than going this um, read access and particularly the simple security role so the no read up is easy to do <laughs> at an entire database or at a table level it's easy to say, okay, this user doesn't have this access. And you have, um, I, I don't know if uh, who of you, uh, who of you uh, or, or among you are familiar with MySQL, Postgres, or have used these databases uh, extensively. Um, you can very, with high granularity, define what a user can do. You, have these, you can say it per table and so on. 
And um, if you have used you have my, used MySQL, have you actually uh, at the at the lowest level done this, given specific table rights to users before? Yeah. Have you ac actually ever seen column rights to users in MySQL? No. <coughs> no. I'm sorry. No, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them. Is it in there? It is. It is. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> one says it is, and one says I don't think so. It's it's actually not that simple, um, because you because of this. If you had the column granularity, how do you deal with that? It, it, you might be able, you can of course specify this whether or not your flavor of database uh, supports this. That's not really the issue here. Um, but let's say you can specify this, but how you deal with it is a problem. <coughs> So if you can query it, is it there or not? What kind of answer are you getting? And um, the solution, of course, is to check all the data that comes back from the query, whether or not you had access. But this is slow. Obviously, having to check all that is not really desirable. Um, and I have to say, I know from uh, uh, some experience, second-hand experience, that you can actually get interesting results. <coughs> Are you familiar with SAP? I know someone who does a lot of audit work. And one of the, f the fun problems they uh, have, uh, SAP has sometimes a tendency that if you ask it for a query, query and you know you have access, or you think you have access, and you're doing a query and you know you should be getting data, you get an empty result set. It just answers there's nothing there, rather than saying you don't have access. You get very interesting effects sometimes, yes? Um, at my internship we mitigated the um, access control part on a column basis by building an HTTP API over it. If someone was not authorized to access the column or not, we would send them uh, not authorized header. Okay, so you tacked on uh, a RESTful API to deal with the column uh, column based restrictions. Okay, yeah, that's more high level. Yeah, it's a that's a, an interesting way of dealing it. Yeah, it it is it becomes quite a quite an issue. <coughs> and um, okay, well, element granularity, uh, no extra concerns. Um, but w there is an example uh, after this sheet of how you can get into. Uh, problems with this. So you have the same issue with the star property which says no write down. Still the same thing we saw previously. So you are allowed to write up, remember? We're, we're logging something so let's say we're running a low uh, clearance process and it wants to insert information into the database but it does it with a key that already exists previously. This can happen why can this happen? Well, you don't know if the key is already there. No read up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what? How do you deal with that? Because it's still a perfectly viable way of store. Yeah, for you, it's you, you need to store this information. So you can reject it, but that's basically saying <laughs> leaking information. Damn, we don't want that. You can replace it. That's about the worst thing, I guess, from an integrity point of view. Probably also undesirable. Um, or you can poly instantiate for the triple word score in Scrabble and have multiple rows with the same key. Um, there is a caveat there. What's the, the tricky point there? You don't have primary key. <coughs> well, you have it, but it's not. Some databases what might not allow you to yeah. do that, actually. <laughs> So that's not really a primary key then anymore, indeed. Um, so you have um, the same problem. You, you, you can run into this problem. So very simply put, you can end up with something like this with databases, oddly enough. Very simple example, but it, I think it's pretty clear. Okay, um, so this, this idea of a trusted platform module, um, 
most computers these days have uh, a form of this. Uh, the whole idea of, uh, what was it, the EFI booting is also designed with the idea of TPM in mind that you can start doing this. Um, my first question to you is why do you see, why are they talking about the motherboard smart card processor approved and then also authenticated boot? Why are we suddenly talking about hardware? Is anyone f familiar with the concept, the overall concept behind this? Why do we suddenly need to start talking about hardware on this end? In the case of trusted computing. Or use like smart cards to authorize users? Mm, yes. It, the, the problem is more uh, fundamental actually, or the reason is more fundamental rather, it's not really a problem. Um, the whole idea of trusted computing is the idea, the model of a chain of trust. Has anyone heard that term before? The chain of trust. So that's, that's where we're going with this. But the chain of trust already implies that you, you need to start a chain somewhere. <coughs> and you need to start the chain at the beginning because what the whole idea of a chain of trust is, is that every next link in the chain is verified by the previous one. So you need to start at the lowest level. Um, Simplifying it a bit, but it's simp really as simple as that. So, um, you usually have the authenticated boot surface, and this is why it's so difficult to install different operating systems sometimes on modern laptops because of this uh, EFI thing where you need to sign bootloaders and all that nonsense, which is very cool if you're into security as a company, but it's very annoying if you're a home user and a hacker and want to just do what your system as you please. Um, think about this from, uh, for now from a corporate point of view. So the, the idea is, is that you, um, as I said previously, that you have this whole chain of events during the startup right down to the last step where you're using a specific program as a user, where every part, next part of that process is verified by the previous one using most commonly a form of a digital signature. And then I'm literally talking about signing usually uh, using a form of PKI. <coughs> Anyone here with a console? Any gaming consoles? Show of hands. Xbox, Playstations, I'm sure. Nearly all game consoles use this as well, the same principles, to verify that you're not using copied DVDs or Blu-rays, the whole idea of chain of trust. Yes, Rowan. Does that work with hashing in some way? Yes, yeah, just like with PKI, the same idea, it's behind it, same mechanisms and ideas. Um, of course, an audit is kept, <coughs> once again, we want to not only verify that it's in order, but also log that it's in order and it well it's, it, it talks about a configuration that is well defined with approved components uh, keep it simple you just want to have exact control over what happens with the system what runs on it and what shouldn't be running on it and so on because the things that are supposed to be running are signed and verified as being in order So there's a, a certification service. <coughs> Once you're done with that configuration, you put everything into the TPM. The TPM can act as a service, a digital certificate. We've covered all this before with the PKI, PKI talk, so I won't go into depth here. This is just a very smart way of a very, if you do it properly, that is, a very secure way of controlling the environment. So, <coughs> who here has, uh, you might, if you're in front of the camera, you might not want to show your hands, but who here has successfully broken the protection on his game console? <laughs> exactly. So, that is usually a case of the 
uh, chain of trust being not, implement, not being implemented correctly, that it's possible. But um, of course, there's always that issue. Um, provided it's done correctly, it's, it could be working fault-free. So it's uh, still hierarchical, like I said, because of the chain of trust. Uh, there's an encryption service usually on TPMs. Why is this there? So it can offer, usually based on the private key, here. It has some keys in it <coughs> that are unique to the machine. It can offer <coughs> encryption and signing for the things that happen on that machine to prove that this was the case. So these TPMs are nice technology, but as I said, whether or not you like them might depend on what you uh, are doing with your computer or want to do with it. Um, <coughs> so this is what they are in a very simple sense. They are literally just a chip usually. Um, take a guess, anything, what, uh, what is special about these chips? Yeah, they need a good R RNG if they're doing an encryption service. Anything else? Anything you can say about the hardware itself of these chips? Yeah, you cannot open them without breaking them. They shatter into uh, oblivion. You can't read the keys out of them. Obviously, the private key needs to be well protected and so on. So, good point. <coughs> they're usually located in such a way that they're not uh, reachable and readable and so on externally. You might even find them coated in epoxy. So it's a, you know, the, the epoxy stuff. It's a sort of lacquer type stuff that covers the chip so you can't reach the connectors anymore, the pins on it. Um, so this is a, an example of uh, how this encryption would do. This is, once again, this is an example of PKI, public private key, where you need, in this case, Particularly, it could work with something like uh, a smart card you put in, where the description is done. I'm not going to go into details with this. <coughs> um, so if I, I asked a few slides ago if anyone has seen this, but you will see this in companies. They will often have computers where they have these keyboards with these slots where you put in a smart card. And usually, combination of software and hardware is then used, hopefully with this TPM and all these mechanisms behind it, for you to be able to log in, for instance, and so on on these systems. So they are used in practice. So I was a bit surprised that no one has seen them before. Okay, so um, with regards to the evaluation part. So there are many standards and uh, in some cases, there are, uh, for some things, there are also certifications where you can, as a company or organization, you can see if you... Um, well, it's actually not a badly worded, provide greater confidence in IT product security. Basically, a way for you as, a, as an organization to say, look at how good we're doing things. Not just to yourself, but also to the external world because you can be developing using secure requirements, so that's also the part of assurance, if you remember, think about quality assurance and so on, very common in software development. Um, operation in according with, accordance with requirements, so that could be something like doing these frequent audits to prove that everything is working as intended and so on. So, um, and I already mentioned this, if you, use, if you do some of these evaluations and you do them successfully, you will be certified as such as an organization. It, can be, you can, it could be listed, uh, your product may be evaluated, so your organization might be certified or get a certification and so on. Um, is anyone familiar of, uh, with any certifications for companies? Yes? Sorry? Yeah, can you name one? Uh, UCP, for example, they were DO178B certified. DOA178B? 
Well, sorry? DO17AB. DO17AB certified. Yeah, that's on, uh, a mouthful? System. Oh, flight control system. Okay. <coughs> I'm not familiar with that one, so you surprised me on that one. Anyone know any others? There are standards for information security management. There are many standards. 27,001, 27,002, see some people nodding. There are many of these uh, uh, assessments you can do as a company and hopefully go for certifications and so on. So um, there is uh, usually talk of a target of evaluation. So some part that you want to evaluate And that's the, well, basically the most important thing. The rest pretty much speaks for itself. I'm sure you're familiar with what functional requirements are and so on. So we'll skip out that. Just remember the term TOE. You will see it in the next few slides. And <coughs> the common criteria has a lot of functional requirements. And I'm going to get take a wild stab and say that this is not readable for everyone. So lo look it up in the presentation online, the different parts. It's basically uh, a list of all the different parts that you will need to evaluate. <coughs> so you come up with a protection profile. <coughs> for instance, for the smart card in this case, IT security requirement for smart card use by sensitive applications. So you start describing usually what kind of threats are there. Physical probing, invalid input, uh, what are the objectives? What are the requirements? So you said this is a really uh, something that is uh, a lot of paperwork, and I've had stu uh, uh, actually several students, at least one last year, who did this for a company uh, uh, evaluation. In this case, for uh, 27,001 certification, if I remember correctly, it was just like a huge stack of paper, mostly a paper exercise. Because it's a lot of work, even for a simple system, if you have to describe all the different threats, actors, and so on, it, it starts to add up. So, um, what is assurance in the sense of security? You can just say, well, I'm this, or maybe this, I don't know, sure that everything is working as it should be. I love these vague descriptions. So <laughs> it even states it's not an absolute guarantee that the measures work as intended. So um, what did I say, once again, what did I say at the start of this lecture? Assume, are assume everything is broken. This <laughs> plan for the worst, the same thing applies here with this. Um, just a small sidestep, if I name a few things like a Target, Home Depot, JP Morgan Chase, is that ringing any bells for anyone? I see some people nodding, what am I referring to? So and what is interesting about these three I just named? It was, they had the huge amounts of customer data stolen or sometimes credit card information, but what is particular about these three recent cases? They refused to support Apple Pay and came up with their own system. No, actually not that. That came much later. That's not related to these uh, incidents, security incidents. There's something other, uh, something else important to note about these three. They were all, despite these security incidents, they were all what? Certified. Certified. They had certifications for this. So if you think this doesn't happen even to, you would think that, a, well, I would hope that a bank has the best security, and I'm sure this is going to bite me in the ass if I ever want to apply for a bank, but a bank job somewhere, but banks probably have the best security in the world, and it still goes wrong from time to time. That's reality. No matter how good your certifications are, it's, uh, things can go wrong, and they will at some point. So it's an important realization. This is, it's no coincidence that it says an absolute guarantee 
doesn't exist with this. So this is also, it's not any different from saying we have best practices. That doesn't mean that they're the best under, any, uh, under all circumstances or that they solve all problems. They're just, we, we do things to the best of our ability and that's the same with security. So assurance and evaluation, you have different target audiences. I feel like a marketer now. Um, the consumers, they want to know, is my stuff safe? Developers, they have completely different requirements usually. The evaluators, they might be external or not. Um, <coughs> I'll skip to the next one. If you start, this is uh, these are fantastic uh, sheets with everything on them. Um, so depending on what you're doing assurance and evaluation for, and what your target oh, pardon, what your targeted audience is, you're going to hit a lot of these, or may maybe even all of them, are going to be part of your scope. And once again, please remember that many of these things are not just technical things, they are also procedural things. Uh, to, to go back to my example I gave of the student who was doing this uh, uh, certification procedure for I, the ISO uh, uh, norm, um, much of what he described of the, uh, these uh, actions that they undertook to get up to the standard needed for the certification were actually not related to changes in their digital systems or the way they used their digital systems. It was purely uh, procedural changes in the company to make sure that there was a separation of responsibilities in place and duties and so on. So it can be, uh, there can be a significant change in the way uh, the business processes work sometimes. So there are uh, evaluation assurance levels and this is basically um, if you do this common criteria evaluation you get a nice stamp at the end that says you suck if you're EAL1 <laughs> or you rock if you're EAL7. Um, I was doing some research into this actually I would um, also um, encourage you to do it as well. Take a look at uh, some of the operating systems that are around such as Linux, uh, different f distributions because some of these actually have these assurance levels. Uh, levels. I believe Red Hat, maybe someone who is online can quickly look, I think Red Hat had EAL 4 plus at some point. So not half bad I would guess. And it can be of course a good selling point for a company to have this or a product to have this assurance level. Um, Particularly if you're going to look at security enhanced Linux, so SE Linux and its use, you will see that it very much operates from these principles. That's why many of the things in SE Linux you will recognize from the stuff we've covered in, in identity and access management. So everything from these different kinds of access control and all these uh, procedural things or models behind them, you will also find in SE Linux. Yes, Rowan? Does it have a relation to ETLs with the maturity levels? Um, the question was, does this have a relation with I ITIL, so ITIL uh, uh, maturity levels? Yes, just like it has a relation with CMM levels. Um, it's, it's, it's usually from a 1 to 7 or 0 to 7 an indication of how well you do things. Otherwise there's not a direct relation on its content as far as I'm aware. This is really uh, geared towards security or security assurance, rather, these common criteria. So the organization that gives you this uh, uh, evaluation is uh, the NIST or the NSA, if I remember correctly. So the NSA is actually heavily involved in SE Linux. It was one of their, uh, one of their, uh, uh, they were, I believe, one of the primary, if not the, the uh, primary developer for SE Linux. And it's 
of course, blindingly obvious why they would want to have this, this kind of technology. Okay, so um, these are some of the considerations that are part of the evaluation. <coughs> this is why I said remember the TOE, the target of evaluation. <laughs> so <coughs> the more you want to, some things to note, of course, if you want to reach higher levels, it costs progressively or even maybe even exponentially more time to reach that and more time is more cost and so on so what you're aiming for is also very important to remember and eventually after everything checks out as I said I was actually right the NIST and the NSA um, you get a report at the end of the conclusion that says, okay, you have evaluated as this level. Uh, is anyone working in a company that actually has an EAL? Okay, could be. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty much it. Not too much stuff for today. Um, <coughs> 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 Pardon. Before we uh, oh, careful. Before we finish for today, are there any questions? Yes. Good. Sorry. Could you repeat the first part? The the question is who does the audit for? Uh, uh, in this case, I believe you asked twenty seven thousand one. Yeah. Or, well, for, for pretty much all audits. Um, you have, you, there's usually talk of internal and external audits, but for these certifications, these actual certifications, the answer is actually really simple. It's always an external. It needs to be, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Dutch commercial, WC Eend, Wij van WC Eend adviseren WC Eend. I mean, it, it's in, it just in a nutshell, uh, a company might be big and have an internal audit department, but if they want to get official certifications, they need to have an external party certify this. An independent, objective party. And the key po point is independent and objective. So these certifications are, or should always be done by externals. But there is an issue with that because um, If you're a big company and you have lots of money, it can be quite easy for you to say, well, if you give us the certification, we'll pay for you, the hotel stay for you as long as you're in our company. And you know, it's easy to get on a slippery slope with this. I assume people are broken and buggy as well. That's what I always say. <laughs> so yeah, it's, a, it's difficult. But in, in, let's say, as always, let's assume there are no absolute guarantees that everything is operating as intended, then it's always an external, some external organization that will do the certification and say at the end, it can be something like Madison Gorka in the Netherlands or Gartner or there are many of them actually. Go on. If Fox IT do them, I wouldn't be surprised, but I can't say for sure. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they did actually. I think it's it's probably the, one of their core businesses, but I'm sure that they do a lot of pen testing. So I wouldn't be surprised if they also do the actual certifications afterwards. Any other questions? The chain of trust is that like the same as the CA model with the X519 certificate? Yeah, the whole idea of a chain of trust, uh, the the concept of a chain of trust. Once again, I would encourage you to read up on that as well, on, on these points. It's the same underlying principle, yeah. Because if, even there, at some point you need to start somewhere at the very beginning, and in the case of the CA, it's the local root certificate you have installed for these CAs, the local trust store. That's where the chain of trust starts there for you, in this case. Any other questions? Okay, I have one more question for you. I usually give a, <coughs> if there's enough interest, I did this always with the minor forensics as well, I always like to give a fun lecture about console hacking. 
game console hacking. Not actually game console hacking, and it's a theoretical lecture, but it combines many of the things that, uh, that we've covered when it comes to crypto, chain of trust, uh, all this, these kinds of things. Um, if you're interested in that and you would like to have this lecture, I can plan it, so I will guest lecture in my own theme semester, oddly enough. But I will only do it if there's enough uh, interest in it, because it does take time. So I will put up a, I would like to have a show of hands maybe, just to get an indication. Who would like to see? Okay. <laughs> okay, so I guess that's 85, 90% right of, okay, I will see you about, see about planning that somewhere. Okay. No problem. Any other questions before we're done for today? Yes? Yes? I always update it every year. If, if applicable, I will update it. But it's, if you look at the, I think there's actually from several years, you can see it progress and progressively more info gets added. But I don't think there's been any major developments recently, but I need to research it. It cost me a little bit of time, but I like doing it. So, yes, Raul. Guys, one second, quiet, please. There's one more question. Yes, Raul. Oh, that's actually a good question. I forgot about that. Um, a, P, a PGP key signing party. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Does anyone want to do a PGP? We can combine it with the uh, console hacking lecture, if you would like. <coughs> but then it will mean some work will be required on your end as well, if you will, because uh, key signing implies that you also prepare and come with your key, your public key, and ID cards and so on. So is everyone up for that as well? Yeah. Then we'll okay. Then we'll combine the two things. No problem. All right. Thank you.